They tell us what's happening during a fight, even though we can see the things that are happening if we watch the fight. But they know a lot more about it, so it's nice. I'm talking about commentators. And in MMA, it seems when they're not giving their expert opinions, they're getting into a whole bunch of hot water and or are the center of controversy. Is this exclusive to MMA? Probably not. But man, it sure feels like there's a new story every week. So let's take a look at the most infamous, shall we? I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are the 10 biggest MMA commentator controversies. Number 10. Dom Cruz calls out DC. Oh, that Dominic Cruz. He's like a young Slim Shady. He's got the balls to say in front of y'alls and he don't gotta be false or sugarcoated at all. It was fight week for UFC 269. The Dominator was putting the headset down for the weekend to do some fisticuffs with Pedro Munoz and as is customary on the Wednesday before a show, participated in a media scrum. Cruz was asked about his fellow commentators and what it's like having them call his fight. After praising John Anik, Dom had this to say about Daniel Cormier. When it comes to DC, you know, I. I usually mute it. I love DC, he's my friend. To me, from my experience, he doesn't do the homework. He, he wants to get in and out, get the job done, make his money. And I think he cares about us, but it's just different. He doesn't do the preparation from my experience. The soundbite went viral and everybody wanted to know what DC thought about his broadcast partner throwing him under the bus. Luckily, we all got to find out when the former double champ confronted Cruz over the matter during an interview on his YouTube channel. It was wrong of you to say what you said this morning. Oh, so I'm wrong. Because that was not fair of you as a colleague to do that publicly. You to tell do, me. To do well, what? Like did, what me, did I do? Though? Up now that's what I call entertainment. Hilariously, by the end, Michael Bisping would hop in and try to defuse the situation. Well, why don't you just do some research and you come? <laughs> <laughs> what is, so wait a minute. All in all, the beef wasn't that heated, more lukewarm. But you can tell it bothered DC. I think the funniest aspect of this one though is Cruz saying that the media took what he said out of context. Classic line. You can just say it about anything. The spat would lead to a bit of discussion over DC's commentary style in the lead up to the event, but things have died down between the two cents. Number nine, John Annick's bizarre fighter details. There are times when a commentator will interject an interesting detail about the fighters live in the middle of the broadcast to give the viewer some perspective on the combatants in the cage. It gives them a sense of humanity. Francis Ngannou has stated that he's a Frosted Flakes guy, but will opt out of the Flakes in favor of the Cheerios. These aren't just two gladiators competing for our collective bloodlust. They're actually people who have lives and stakes beyond winning and losing. It's a pretty common tactic in sports, and for the most part, it's done very effectively by the UFC and its various broadcast team members. One who rarely misses is John Anik. The now cornerstone member of the commentary booth is just about the most reliably great professional on the microphone in the entire sport, which is why quite a few fans were scratching their heads when Anik had this to say. Both of these fighters have dealt with custody battles involving their children. Andre Yule's son Eli is seven, and as of this broadcast, does not have rights to see him, does not know where his son is. In the first round of the bout between Andre Yule and Chris Gutierrez at UFC 258. Holy shit! John would go on to explain that Yule's newest son is his pride and joy, a silver lining to the story, before going on to mention that Gutierrez is dealing with a similar situation. Now look, obviously this was not meant to disparage these two fighters. In fact, Yule praised Anik for bringing his situation to light. He wants help in his custody battle, and so the exposure and awareness he saw as a positive. Gutierrez did not feel the same way. He was very upset about his personal life being such a prominent part of the broadcast. Cast. Usually those human interest details hit well, but for some, this jarring revelation mid-fight was a big miss. Number eight, Pat Miletic gets fired from LFA. All right, this should be a fun one to talk about. So MMA pioneer, UFC Hall of Famer, and regular regional show commentator Pat Miletic was working the booth for LFA as their play-by-play -play guy until the day that he wasn't, and that was January 12th of 2021. Six days earlier, videos and images spread online of Pat at the Save America March, that rally that ended with a whole bunch of people inside the Capitol building that don't work there. After a few days of the images spreading through the MMA social media sphere, Miltich would post a now deleted video on his Instagram, letting people know he was fired from LFA due to public pressure over his participation on January 6th. But uh, the LFA was was getting a lot of pressure and, and unfortunately they felt they, they needed to distance themselves from me. And that he was not involved in any of the violence nor was witness to it. LFA, who was just a few days away from their next card, came out afterwards and made a statement that hilariously started with their support of the constitutional right to peaceful protest. They went on further to say that Pat was suspended pending further investigation. Classic wishy-washy statement. Miltich later told Josh Gross that the promotion was hoping things would just die down a bit later and he could be reinstated, but he told them he didn't want that kind of heat on them and that there wasn't any bad feelings, so he would just go ahead and stay away from LFA going forward. The commentator hasn't done a show with the promotion since. Number seven, Chris Cordero's rise in commentary. Not since that guy who was freaking out during the Fedor fight at FNG 50. I can't believe my eyes, what's going on? 
Has a commentator single-handedly made themselves the sole conversation after an event? Enter Chris Cordero following the Ryzen World Cup GP 2017 second round. Chris was charged with play-by-play -play duties for the English broadcast of the event alongside UFC veteran Anthony Burchak. Cordero was a good fit on paper. He'd been in the MMA business for years and headed promotions like Cage Rage and King of the Cage. But that didn't translate into a solid night on the mic. He kicked things off by being over an hour late to the broadcast, leaving Burchak to do the whole thing on his own. Oops. He probably should have just stayed home, though. Things would have worked out better for him. Cordero was abysmal. He kept calling the promotion Risen like a noob. Great to be here, though, in Japan for an exciting Risen event. Instead of, you know, somebody who was hired by Ryzen to talk about Ryzen for hours at a time at a Ryzen event. Risen. Why don't you tell us about the fighters from Punk Crosse next while you're at it, Chris? But that wasn't the worst of it. Sure, he mispronounced a bunch of fighters' names, too. The Shintaro Ishikawa Ishiwatari fight. But Cordero's regular belittling of the female talent on the card was what did him in. He said Miyu Yamamoto didn't look bad for her age, even though women tend not to age well. She looks great as a, as, as a female. Generally, they don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't tend to age as well as the gentleman. Thanks for that incredible expert analysis, Chris. He also said Rina Kubota was in the main event because she was cute. Probably her cuteness has elevated her to main event status here. It had nothing to do with her insane shoe boxing record and unbeaten MMA career that had seen every single one of her victories end via a finish. Couldn't be that. Cordero has not commentated for Risen ever again. Number six, Jimmy Smith's stupid firing. If there's anything I learned from my own brief time in television, it's that you should never get too comfortable because things can change real fast. And Jimmy Smith knows that lesson all too well as well. For nearly a decade, Smith was the guy at Bellator and he'd done a fantastic job. My favorite moment ever being when he refused to lose his microphone during the insanity that was Stefan Bonner's confrontation of Tito Ortiz. In 2017, though, Smith and the promotion just couldn't come to terms, and knowing a good thing when they saw it, the UFC quickly snatched him up to start calling fights. A year would go by, and everybody was just loving it. Jimmy was doing a great job. He fit the broadcast team well. He always did his homework, and no, that's not a shot at DC. But then, out of absolutely nowhere, he was let go. Bye, you're done, one year. It was nice having you. Hope you didn't anticipate this being your entire future after leaving a company you worked for for nearly a decade. Aid. Apparently, the UFC had decided that from now on, they only wanted fighters in the booth as analysts. Except for, you know, Joe Rogan and the fact that Jimmy was actually a fighter as well. But they meant their fighters, at least until Lorisenko was finally allowed to be a commentator. But for that brief window, they only wanted their fighters, and so Jimmy had to go. Smith took the news like a boss and now is the play-by-play -play guy on Raw for the WWE, which is absolutely awesome. Number five, Dan Hardy goes off on Herb Dean. So this is a story all about how Dan Hardy's life got flipped turn up upside down. The reptilian commentator is largely considered one of the best analysts in the entire business. He's also very passionate about the sport, and that passion sometimes manifests itself as a blinding rage, apparently. At Fight Island 3, remember Fight Island? Hardy was in the booth with the always classy John Gooden and Paul Felder. Now, if you recall during that portion of the pandy, there were no crowds allowed, and so you could just about hear every single word and even thought the commentary team had during a fight. When Francisco Trudaldo folded Jai Herbert up like a note you passed in third grade, Hardy and the crew were celebrating an incredible knockout finish. The problem was Herb Dean didn't stop the fight, and after Trinaldo threw a few more shots on the ground, the ref finally stepped in as Hardy and Felder raged just feet away in a very quiet room. Come on! It's not over! Stop the fight! This would result in a confrontation between Dan and Herb that was picked up on the broadcast and became a big old thing online. Dana White warned afterwards that talking to officials like that would result in an instant firing in the future. If you work for me and you approach a judge or a referee or any type of official, I will fire you. It would be another incident though, six months later, that would see Hardy actually can. Some kind of altercation with a UFC staff member, but he cites the Herb Dean incident as the beginning of the end with the UFC, as they were not going to tolerate any more issues with the commentator. Number four, Joe Rogan misses UFC 271. Where in the world was Joe Rogan at UFC 271? That was the hot topic heading into the show, as the longtime UFC commentator found himself at the center of the news and social media cycle in the weeks leading up to the event, all to do with his $200 million Spotify podcast, that little thing he does when he's not screaming oh at the top of his lungs on fight night. After public pressure on Spotify to do something about Rogan's pandemic takes, along with those of his more controversial guests, the giant streaming platform decided to start adding disclaimers to podcasts that might have tenuous COVID claims. Then a compilation of Rogan saying the N-word on his podcast went viral, again putting Joe and Spotify in the hot seat. And this was right in the lead up to UFC 271. Spotify would remove 
a whole bunch of episodes, Joe would make an apology video. It was one of the biggest stories in all of entertainment the week of the pay-per-view. The day before the card per a UFC official, Rogan would not be on commentary due to a scheduling conflict. People immediately suspected that there was no scheduling issue at all, and that would seemingly be confirmed when Joe texts John Anik during the main event to speculate on an injury. Joe Rogan just texted me and Daniel that Izzy might have hurt his right hand. After the show, Dana White dismissed the idea of a scheduling conflict. Joe Rogan could have worked tonight. I know that came out. It's total bullshit. And said you'd have to ask Joe, but he could have commentated on the card and he would be back for the next pay-per-view. As of this writing, that's all we know, but I'm sure more about this will come out in the weeks and months ahead, considering Joe spends three hours every day unloading his brain into a microphone in front of millions of people. Number three, Kenny Florian's suspension for plagiarism. He was one of the faces of the UFC broadcast team a la Fox Sports for nearly a decade. Kenny Florian, the former lightweight and featherweight title contender and tough alum, was one of the most beloved members of the MMA community during his day. He had strong commentary, he was a great analyst, he dressed up like a samurai for his title fight with Sean Shirk, but in 2016, Ken Flo got himself into a bit of hot water. Fans discovered that a good portion of a breakdown he wrote for Fox Sports analyzing the upcoming bout between Dominic Cruz and TJ Dillashaw, particularly as it related to Dom's footwork, had been pulled from a video that Lee Wiley did on YouTube about Willie Pep. When the discovery was made, the article was pulled and Fox Sports temporarily suspended Florian, who was at the time anchoring UFC Tonight. Kenny would make a public apology and give the explanation that he often kept notes in a haphazard manner and hadn't realized that what he was using was Wiley's work versus ideas he'd come up with on his own. Lee was very forgiving publicly and even felt bad about the situation, which just goes to show you that's one nice dude. Following the Bantamweight title bout, the Florian article was meant to preview after incredibly regaining the championship he'd once held after coming back from two career-ending injuries. Dominic Cruz took a moment in his post-fight interview to tell Kenny to stop copying and pasting. Just a little because who needs enemies when you got friends like Dom Cruz? Number two, Stephen A. Smith enrages fans. There's a certain level of respect that MMA commentators and analysts will generally give the fighters. After all, this isn't a game where somebody must get a ball to a special location signifying that points have been scored, and largely the athletes aren't even allowed to touch each other. This is two people engaged in mortal combat with real pain, real injuries, and if there wasn't a referee, a real ending. It's just a different beast. Which is why so many people were salty with ESPN megastars Stephen A. Smith following UFC 246. The longtime sports commentator is known for his outlandish takes. He and Skip Bayless took the pardon the interruption format and injected it with Brock Lesnar juice, thus creating the insane hyper hot take sports broadcast world that we have today. The crazier the shit you say, the better. They are trash! It doesn't translate well to MMA though, especially when you're talking on the actual broadcast right after the main event and absolutely shitting all over Donald Cerrone for his performance against Conor McGregor. Stephen A. was adamant that he could have at least run around longer than Cowboy lasted. I could have ran for 40 seconds. I disagree. And accused Cerrone of being a quitter who chokes under pressure. Cowboy Cerrone just didn't look right. As you can imagine, people weren't happy about this. Including Joe Rogan, who was right next to Smith during these segments, and Conor McGregor. It was a hot topic on Twitter and all the MMA websites for a few weeks, but in the end, Stephen A stuck by his commentary and went along his way with the bajillion dollars he makes a year pissing off sports fans. Number one, the UFC does Mike Goldberg dirty. If you even knew just the slightest about the UFC in the last 20 some odd years, there's a decent chance you were familiar with Mike Goldberg and Joe Rogan as the longtime voices of the Octagon. They were the two mainstays of the promotion in the booth. It's just how it was. You didn't need to be an expert on MMA to know that the pair were always on the broadcast. Goldberg, while often memed for some of his sillier moments, Michael Jordan esque in his grappling skills is Travis Luter. No. No, it's not. was still very much appreciated by fans during his near 20-year tenure on the microphone for the UFC, certainly enough so for them to be sour about the fact that he was fired so unceremoniously in 2016. The winds of change had blown in and the promotion was under new management. WME IMG decided Mike had just like that in his last fight, and according to the former commentator, he was given no explanation on the matter, he was just told that UFC 207 would be his final broadcast. Fans who tuned in and were expecting some kind of tribute to the veteran broadcaster were in for a big surprise. Their there was no video package, no kind words from the team talking about how much they would miss him. They didn't even let Goldberg mention that this was his last show. No goodbye message, nothing, not a single word. If you watched the broadcast and didn't know it, you'd have no idea that he was never going to return. A few months later, Mike would end up in Bellator, but fans never forgot when the UFC did Goldie dirty on his way out. Big ol' shout out to my dude Luke Taylor for editing this video together. You can find him and his awesome digital art on Twitter at cool to me underscore. A big, big thank you to Benro 
Rosette, who provided that sweet tune you heard in the intro. Check out his music by clicking the link in the description and go give him a follow on his Instagram and Twitter page at Ben Rosette. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.